morning or good afternoon to wherever you're joining us from. I'm Julie Broadway, president of the American Horse Council, and we're delighted that you could join us today. We know this is a popular subject. We had 60 people register for this and we are recording it. So if you miss a piece and have to step away, you can go back to our website and listen to the full recording. Um, and you are welcome to point people to the recording uh, at a later date uh, so that if they weren't able to attend, they'll get the benefit of, of hearing all this great information. So I jokingly said when we started uh, that this is the Julie and Julie show this afternoon. Um, so I am just delighted to have one of my favorite people uh, from uh, Foster Swift join us. Julie has been a practicing attorney for 35 years. She focuses on equine law as well as business and insurance litigation. Uh, she on uh, equine liability and insurance matters. Her practice is national in scope and she has tried cases before juries in at least four states. She's the author of four books on equine law and she's spoken at numerous, numerous uh, events. And she's just a wealth of information. I consider her to be the industry's subject matter expert on the whole issue of equine liability. And before we go, she did not ask me to do this, but I am going to give a shameless plug for her new book, uh, which is called Equine Law and Horse Sense. Uh, when people call the American Horse Council, they're often struggling with a decision about their business, uh, and they're trying to get all the resources they can. And I frequently refer them to this book because it is invaluable. It's got great information. It's an easy read. And I uh, encourage you to check this thing out. So there's lots of good stuff about this in here. And some of the things you're going to hear her talk about today, of course, are covered in this book. So it's a great, a great reference uh, here. Um, so let's do a few little logistics. Thank you for joining us again. Please put yourself on mute so that we don't have a whole lot of background noise and a lot of distractions. We would call your attention if you've used Zoom at all to the bottom of your screen is where we most likely will find the chat feature. And we would encourage you that if you have a question, put it in the chat box. Now, when we talk about equine uh, liability laws, um, everybody's got a different scenario. And we may not be able to get to all those individual unique cases that you have, but if you put it in the chat, we promise we will get back to you afterwards. And we're gonna give you um, Julie's contact information and I'm certain that she would be happy to spend a few minutes of her time telling you where to find a resource that could help you uh, to address whatever your question might be. So we've got a few little things like that. The second half of our webinar, we're going to spend some time with our great friends over at Jarvis Insurance, Stephanie and Tina, talking about the things you need to be aware of when you actually purchase some liability insurance coverage. It's not just so black and white. There's a lot of gray in there. So they're going to talk you through a little bit of that. We'll allow some time for questions after Julie's done with her first portion, and then some time with uh, Stephanie and Tina at the end. Um, and so we're really excited about this. Uh, the American Horse Council is a bipartisan advocacy organization based in Washington, D.C., and we provide all types of educational resources for the equine industry. We do a quarterly webinar. So I'm going to say this is our third quarter webinar, and we'd love to have you come back for the fourth quarter webinar which is gonna be on November the 14th. And we will be talking about the current shortage in equine and small animal veterinarians, which is being tackled by the American Association of Equine Practitioners and a few of our uh, equine partners across the space to talk about workforce development types of issues. So that's our upcoming topic for the fourth quarter. But with that, I'm gonna turn the floor over to Julie and we're so delighted to have you with us today. Thanks for making time on your busy calendar. Thank you, Julie. Sounds like somebody needs to mute themselves back there. And good morning or good afternoon, everybody. In the next um, 27 or so minutes, I'm going to cover quite a bit for you. And uh, there may be questions. As Julie mentioned, Julie Broadway, that is, there will be a chance for some of the questions to be answered, but not a whole bunch. And I'll need to drop off uh, during the Jarvis presentation to go to court. So um, let's see what we can cover. And hopefully you'll be ready. Hold on to your hats. We've got a lot to go through. So if I can get my computer to go. This is the fact. We all want to grow the horse industry, right? We want to grow our associations, our clubs. If we have a business, we want that business to grow. We want it to start with kids, maybe not with kids if that's not your area that you um, are working with, but we want people to stay in this organization for the long haul. But what about this? 
this is a reality. So sorry, everything, all the fun has come to a screeching halt because we're looking at the bad news. This looks like a kid who's about to get a broken arm. These things happen in the industry. And why do they happen? We'll take a look. Look at the pinned ears on that horse, probably a mare. Um, this is the reality. This is who we deal with in the industry. Animals that act on instinct. They're strong. They're powerful. They can bite quickly without warning. And as you see on the lower right, they can kick. Somebody is going to get hurt at some point. How do we deal with liability? And even better, how can we control the risk? And that's why I'm ecstatic that we have Jarvis following me because they'll talk a little bit uh, within their time constraints about types of insurance and things you need to be aware of. But here's what I'm going to cover. First, I'm going to review these equine liability laws. Oh, I wish I could tell you about all 48 states, but I'm going to talk about the standard pattern that these laws apply. Uh, next, I'm going to talk about just one risk management issue because it comes up a lot, waivers, releases. Uh, I'm using the term with a slash between them. Some call them waivers, some call them releases. Lawyers know there's actually a big difference between what one does and what the other does. We'll lump them together, uh, but this is the plan. And then of course, there'll be time for just a couple of questions. I'll let Julie Broadway be in charge uh, as to how many get answered during the webinar. Let's get going. Oh, and here's more bad news. Yes, these things happen too um, with, with horses. Let's talk about what these laws are. Surprise. These are often called equine liability laws. Why? Well, the very first one that was passed from the state of Washington, 1989, was an equine liability law. And then that was followed uh, by the state of Colorado. These are equine liability laws, at least when they began. But guess what? These laws are broadened. Look on the lower left. That is not me on a Monday morning. That's an emu. And believe it or not, some of these laws actually apply to emus and donkeys and cattle, sheep, goats, llamas. Um, these are more than equine liability laws now in many states. And many states are broadening them into farm animal laws, such as Kentucky and Texas. Uh, so I'll talk about them as equine liability laws, but keep in mind, your state may call it a Farm Animal Activity Liability Act. So what's the point? Where do we begin with these laws? The laws don't necessarily involve every single person who happens to be near an equine. I'm going to talk about the basic form that many of these states apply. We get outliers out there like the state of Connecticut, that's in a different world of its own. Um, the state of Virginia, it's much different from the others as is Arizona. Some of these states are extremely different from the others, but my discussion today will kind of uh, talk in a generic way about the standard statute that many of the states have, such as the one that we see in Colorado, Massachusetts, um, maybe even Illinois, um, and, and other states, Tennessee, Georgia. This is a discussion focusing on the standard form that many follow, but please remember yours can be different. So let's get to the question here. Who benefits? Well, if you look at the standard form, the laws refer to the benefit, uh, the people who benefit being equine activity sponsors. That's you, your club, your organization, um, your event that you're putting together. You may be an equine activity sponsor or an equine professional. Who's that? Well, it could be riding instructors, breeding farms, boarding stables, uh, things of that type. They may categorize themselves based on the law as an equine professional. These laws in the typical form have definitions. So if you get a copy of your law, easy to do. I'm going to give you a link to help you find it. Take a look and see if you fit within any of these de uh, definitions. Interestingly, some of the laws also benefit another person. What does that mean? Well, if you're not an equine activity sponsor, equine professional, some of these laws broaden it out and say another person, which could be anybody else. The average person with a backyard horse, um, the average horse owner who may not be in business or putting on a, a, an event, you may benefit from these laws. What do I show you in these uh, pictures? Well, in the left, this is probably a horse show somewhere in the world. And these are people in the arena, um, nice arena, nice and grassy one. But the point is this is an organized event. This organizer putting on this event is probably an equine activity sponsor. And then on the right, we have your classic riding instructor. He's an equine professional. Um, and as mentioned, some of these laws apply to the average individual. So take a look at what we have here. Nice little Appaloosa, right? Yeah. 
what if the person riding this Appaloosa is being given that horse to ride by you, but you're not in the business of providing horses. This is your friend, your coworker, your relative. You provided this Appaloosa to a friend to ride someone else, but she gets hurt. Well, you may benefit from your equine liability statute if it benefits another person. So the laws have a reach to them that can be pretty broad and could be very beneficial to a wide variety of people in the industry. Now, who do the laws target? Whose lawsuits, whose claims get limited potentially by the laws? This is where things get a little bit tricky. It typically applies when, again, using the standard form found in most of the states, the law typically applies to bar, that is to say, to stop claims from participants. Well, in the lower part of your screen, people on a trail ride, yeah, I would think they qualify as participants. They're riding, handling, they're with a horse. Uh, gentleman at the right is leading a horse. Yeah, he's probably a participant too. He's working and handling, he's awfully close to the horse. Watch out on the left. Many of the laws around the country have said people visiting and touring an equine facility like these two on the left part of your screen may actually be participants too. But one of the hot issues that lawyers like me are fighting with around the country, people in that category just walking through a barn may not be a participant. That's one of the areas that is a hot litigation point. So how do you know whose claims might be barred, might be stopped by, the, by your state law or by laws where you do business, take a look at the law and see what type of people might be prevented. Usually you'll see a definition of participant because the laws in the general form say that they apply to claims of participants. Do you have any of that based on what you see here? If so, you've got a pretty good law, you've got a broad one. This, as I warned you about, is where things can get complicated. Lawyers are having a blast right now with these laws that have been passed since 1989, as I mentioned. A blast because there are lawsuits all around the country at any given point where people are fighting about whether the law even applies. You may think if anybody happens to be near a horse, well, an equine liability law applies, right? Not true, according to some courts. Take a look at the left. Here's a carriage. There are cases around the country, believe it or not, where the courts have said, if you are a passenger in a carriage, you are not subject to an equine liability law. A passenger, some courts have said, is not engaged in an equine activity. Why? Well, the courts say, if you're just sitting there, you're not controlling the horse. Other courts disagree and say, oh yeah, come on, who's powering this thing? It's a horse, this is an equine activity. This is an example of how things get complicated. Walking through a barn, as I've already warned you about, there are differences among the statutes as to whether visiting and touring an equine facility as part of an organized activity or event would qualify as engaging in an equine activity which is what a participant is supposed to do. So that's an area that courts can't agree on. Spectators, you would think when your club puts on an event and people are wandering around the grounds, whose event are they at? They're at an event of your horse club. It's a horse event. Oddly enough, there are some statutes that say people who just happen to be spectating may not be subject to the law. Odd, isn't it? That's also an interesting insurance issue that you may hear about from the folks at Jarvis because insurance policies may or may not cover claims um, of spectators. Typically they do. It's the participants you may be thinking about with your insurance. If you're a club putting on a horse show, um, some sort of a horse related event and a participant gets hurt in the event, listen to the folks at Jarvis about whether that's covered. You'll probably be covered for claims of spectators. Let's talk about the good and the bad and the ugly maybe of the equine liability laws. The one thing I'd like you to keep in mind, please keep this as your takeaway today. All of these laws differ in unbelievable ways. And I'll try to highlight for you when I have a few moments how they differ. Well, you don't have to, <laughs> unless you have really good eyesight, you don't have to focus too hard on the screen. Here's the good news. The good news is that the typical form around the country says that there is no liability if you are an equine activity professional, sponsor, sometimes another person. If a person, a participant that is, and we've already talked about what that means, is injured from an inherent risk of an equine activity. Okay, so what do we have? I've got a couple of examples for you here. I'm gonna throw a few of them. We've got Indiana, 
and it says subject to subsection two, we're going to get there. That's the bad news. An equine activity sponsor or equine professional. Ooh, Indiana doesn't include another person. That may not be good if you're not in those categories. Is not liable for, and it goes on to injury or death, resulting from an inherent risk of equine activities. Sounds okay if you're in those categories that benefits. Let's go down to Ohio. Ohio says, um, except as provided in Division B2, remember, that's the bad news. We're going to get there. Um, an equine activity sponsor, equine activity participant, equine professional, veterinarian, farrier, or other person is not liable. Ooh, our other person. I think you're getting, you're getting a point here. Ohio's law is broader. It benefits more people. Not liable in damages in a tort or other civil action for harm that an equine activity participant allegedly sustains during an equine activity that results from an inherent risk. Okay, and the law will define inherent risk. Typically, most of the laws do. Inherent risk is defined usually very broadly. For example, some of the laws define it as the propensity of an equine to behave in ways that may result in injury, death, or damage to people on or around them. The unpredictability of an equine's reactions to sight, sound, move, sudden movements, um, surface or subsurface conditions. These are just some examples. So the definition of an inherent risk in many of these states is pretty broad. Plug that in now to the language here that says no liability for an inherent risk. And you're probably thinking, wow, this is pretty darn good. Massachusetts, yeah, it's pretty similar to what I mentioned. They refer to inherent risks. Florida refers to inherent risks. Warning to Florida people, you've got a problem with your law. It talks about the negligence exception. Hold that thought. Minnesota, ah, Minnesota, that's another outlier. Minnesota doesn't have the language of equine activity professional, equine activity sponsor. It says a nonprofit corporation organization or association or a person or other entity donating services for the nonprofit is not liable for, and then it goes on to inherent risk. Interesting for Minnesota. Your law seems to apply to nonprofits. Well, here we go. If that wasn't the good start for the bad news, I don't know what is. We're going to go through briefly within the time I have some of these exceptions. In fact, I'll rush you through all of them. When you think about the laws on a national level and the fact that they do differ, these are the exceptions. These are the things that people could potentially bring a claim or suit against you for. And again, these laws all differ. Let's roll through them quickly. Faulty tech or equipment. This is an exception found in many of the laws, probably the majority. And it says if you provide, you got to provide it. Remember the example of the Appaloosa? And I said, hey, what if this is your friend, relative, coworker? If you provide tech or equipment and you knew or you should have known it was faulty and that problem causes injury, death, or damage, there could be what? liability. Move it on. Um, second. This is the one, it's called reasonable and prudent efforts as I capsulized it. This is where the lawsuits are coming from with the greatest frequency. This is the exception that says, if you provide a horse, so looking at these examples, this has to be a horse that you provided, not somebody on their own horse taking a lesson, you provided. If you provide a horse and you, you, uh, the horse has a, da a uh, dangerous propensity generally, or has some kind of a uh, condition or a history, um, and you fail to make reasonable and prudent efforts to determine the ability of the participant to safely manage the horse, you could be liable. Repeating it, putting it more succinctly. This exception tends to read, if you provide an equine and you fail to make reasonable and prudent efforts to determine the ability of the participant to safely manage that particular equine, there could be liability. Some states, Massachusetts, Michigan, have language about how you should not rely on the representations of the participant, of their ability. We'll put that aside. What you would be wise to know is this is the law that applies, or the exception rather, if you provide a horse to somebody else, and as I view it, you don't match the horse properly with the rider. Um, and there have been cases about this around the country that even if the horse seems perfectly matched to the rider, the handler, the participant, but something starts going on. A case from Massachusetts many years ago says that if you're a riding instructor, maybe you need to stop, stop action and quit the activity. Other states don't look at it that way, but this is the litigation hotbed. This is what people tend to be suing for. Third exception, 
Dangerous, latent, that means not obvious, condition of the land. How does this go? If you own, lease, rent, or are in lawful possession of land or facilities with a dangerous, latent condition for which no conspicuous warning sign is posted, there could be liability. There is a case from Texas involving red ants. Um, I have the example on the left. I don't know where this came from, but it's quicksand. There is quicksand apparently in some parts of the United States. I learned that from the American Horse Council convention years ago. What if that land behind the fence on the left is where you are going to have a organized trail ride for your club? But the organizer knew there was quicksand, just didn't warn people. And next thing you know, people are disappearing and all you see are hats sitting on the ground. We've got a problem here. Um, the law does say that if you have land or facilities with a dangerous latent condition, you should post a conspicuous warning sign. And you're thinking, okay, Fershman, I remember those warning signs. I see them. We've got them on our barn. Wait, this is the kind of warning sign that's contemplated by the law. A conspicuous warning sign about that condition, not just the warning under the Equine Liability Act, which we're going to get to. So the law says if you have a dangerous, latent, not, not obvious condition that you know about, but you don't warn about, well, there could be liability. This is just an example of a warning sign. This is an exception. People think, oh, it's never going to be raised against me. Gross negligence, willful and wanton misconduct, willful or wanton misconduct, things of that type. Um, that's pretty serious wrongdoing. And if I had the time, I would give you examples. I, unfortunately, I don't. People raise this exception with great frequency. Why? Well, I'm going to share with you that if your state enforces waivers and releases of liability, your state probably will allow, no matter how enforceable waivers are, will allow people to sue for this kind of stuff that you see on your screen right here. So a lawyer representing an injured person may take your waiver and try to have it shredded in the court of law by alleging gross negligence, willful and wanton or willful or wanton misconduct. In doing so, they've cited an exception in many of the equine liability laws. And of course, they've got one of the things that courts don't allow people mainly to release away. Intentional misconduct, yeah, of course. Um, many of these laws say nobody can uh, be, uh, you, get, you get no free pass for intentional misconduct. We get that. Negligence. Now, I have heard over the years, um, as I've traveled around, people saying, well, hey, Fershman, um, these equine liability laws, they can't stop a lawsuit for negligence, right? My answer is, absolutely, they can. As a lawyer who deals with these and who helped get my law in my state passed many years ago and amended, I know that the standard of liability for negligence, which is inadvertently doing something, doing something unreasonable or not doing something that is reasonable. That's in a, in a nutshell what negligence is. I know that the standard of negligence in many states is gone with equine activities. If an equine liability law applies, the old negligence standard where almost anything goes against a person with horses is gone. The liability is replaced by those exceptions that you just heard. That tends to be the law around the country. Negligence is gone. So when people ask, hey, people can still sue for negligence, right? Negligence, right? My answer is, well, generally no, except some states, equine liability laws, bring it right back and allow people to sue for negligence, which I believe weakens the laws. What states are those? Okay, flashing it on the screen because I don't have a lot of time here, but I'll try and run it through. Florida, Kansas, Kentucky, Michigan, Michigan has a limited negligence exception. Missouri, Nebraska, Nevada, New Jersey, New Mexico, New York seems to allow liability for negligence. New York's one of those outlier, very unique statutes. Oregon, Rhode Island, Utah, and Virginia. These laws, in my opinion, seem to open up the door for people who are injured to sue an equine activity professional sponsor, sometimes others, for negligence, which could be almost anything. That is a problem in my opinion, and that really does, in my opinion, weaken the statute. Let's shift gears now to signposting requirements. I know many of you have, are thinking, hey, I've seen these signs around, whether in your state or somewhere else. Classic signs are flashing right up on the screen. You got Tennessee, and you've got one on the right, and I don't know what state that's from. Maybe Illinois, can't tell. And we've got Georgia, Idaho. Let's kick it up a notch and get to some of the things you need to know, because not every sign 
is proper. And I want you to leave this with an understanding of what differentiates the legal from the not legal. There are some changes in these laws over the years. I think I started by telling you that some of the equine liability laws are now farm animal laws. Take a look at the sign on your left. That's a new one from Kentucky, a newer sign. But what am I focusing on? It's a Farm Animal Activity Liability Act warning sign. If you have an old sign and you happen to be in Kentucky, you do business in Kentucky, um, take a look at the fact that you'll need to update your sign. And take a look at the sign on the right from Vermont. I don't know if Vermont's law changed, but you'll see that it refers to an equine activity. Um, be aware that with the changes in some of these laws, your signs may need to be changed accordingly. So take a look at the statutes where you live, do business, and determine if your signs have to be uh, changed. This is a problem. These are signs people are putting up and they think, hey, I'm complying with my Equine Liability Act. Oh, no, you're not. These are not Equine Liability Act warning signs. People feel good putting them up, but they shouldn't. The sign on the lower right gives Julie Broadway probably a um, uh, a heart attack <laughs> because it's a sign that's been on the market for many, many years. It looks like an Equine Liability Act warning sign. It even refers to the American Horse Council on the bottom right but that is not an Equine Liability Act warning sign. When you read the laws that affect you, you will never see that language in a sign. So to be a good consumer, if you're going online to buy warning signs, note a few things. People are selling signs out there on the internet that look great, but they're not lawful. Upper left, this is the correct Pennsylvania sign. Upper right, somebody's selling that. That is not a Pennsylvania warning sign. You'll know the difference when you read your law, and you'll also see that Pennsylvania's law requires a very large sign. Here's another one, just as I was mentioning. The correct Kentucky sign refers to farm animal, but on the right, it refers to an equine activity. That was a legal sign, but that was a long time ago. Um, some state signs exist. They're selling them all over the internet, but the law doesn't require it. Here's an Arizona warning sign. That's nice, except Arizona has no signposting requirement. Same with Ohio. I checked both states before I began. Neither of those states has a signposting requirement, but someone's selling signs. Is it a waste of money? That might make you feel good, but you're not complying with the law. Let's get to contract requirements. These are very interesting in terms of how states differ. What do I mean? Example here from Indiana law talks about contracts. It says if there's a written contract, um, this chapter doesn't apply unless it's entered into by a professional. Aha, Indiana's law, like many of them, says that the requirement for certain language in contracts only applies to professionals. That tends to be the same around the country, sponsors or professionals. And it has a warning language requirement and you'll see it. It gives you the language, almost exactly what you see on the signs. That's what I mean by contract language requirement, but things get a little bit uh, sticky because the contract language requirements can really change. So let's talk a little bit about waivers and releases for a moment here. Um, first, check your statute very carefully because they differ, the release requirements differ, and the Equine Liability Acts, in terms of what they want in the releases, really can differ. How so? Here's some examples. I'll spend a little bit of time in the next couple minutes on releases. So right now we're still focusing on equine statutes. Here's an example of how these contract language requirements in the laws differs. Ohio, it has a list of inherent risks of an equine activity. And the Ohio statute says, put this in your contracts, use this language in addition to whatever else you use. People don't know that. And often you'll see the typical warning under the equine liability act kind of stuff like in signs. Well, you don't have that in Ohio. Then you get to Virginia. Virginia, another outlier. Virginia's law has a fancy term of intrinsic dangers. I have yet to see that anywhere else in the country. But Virginia's law says it's essentially not even going to work. It will not apply in Virginia unless you have a waiver of rights to sue, or as they say, an agreement to assume all risks or intrinsic dangers of equine activities. Now that's interesting. So if you're in Virginia and you need a form release and you start checking around online, asking your buddy in California, hey, can you send me your document because you want to use it? Watch out. Your statute seems to suggest you need different language. And then there's Arizona's law. 
yet another outlier, and it doesn't take effect somewhat like Virginia's unless there is a release signed. And it even gives you some ideas of things to include in it, but it is not the warning language that you sometimes see. Here's a great resource, animallaw.info. I like it. You have to maneuver through it. It's a bit tricky at first, but when you figure it out, it will very likely give you your equine liability law. And even better, this is put out by a law school. They update the law. They check it every year. Great information. Animallaw.info. I like it. <clears throat> Takeaway, all statutes differ. Some are broader. Um, they allow certain types of liabilities. There's always a need for insurance. I'm going to skip down to the last bullet point. Follow the requirements for contracts and releases, waivers and releases. Here's a form. This thing was in the books way back when in the 80s and 90s. Is this thing going to protect you? Hmm, no, I'm here to tell you details really matter. And within the next maybe 30 seconds, I'm going to give you some quick thoughts with regard to waivers. Most states around the country have shown a willingness to enforce waivers and releases. This may be an eye opener to many of you, but it is true because I have a sick obsession with the law and I follow it. Most states will. The problem is some of them don't get enforced because somebody messed up. Not proper language, improper signing, things of that type. Very few states will simply not enforce them. I'd like you to keep a few things in mind before I call it quits on my remarks. Um, if you use one, don't just refer to people releasing you when they're riding. Look at this picture in the lower right. This person's about to get run over, bitten, who knows, by this horse. If your release only refers to riding and somebody signs it and this is what happens, your document is powerless. Your document can be broader. It can refer to people releasing when they're riding, handling, or near horses on the premises, a whole bunch of things. What state law does it apply? People have sent me documents and asked, hey, isn't this great? But what state law does it apply? Sure, you're in the state of Tennessee, but the document doesn't say Tennessee law applies. You have operations that could be around the country. What state law does it apply? Well, we would help to mention it. Does it apply today only, or does it apply in the future? These are details for your document because questions do arise when a person signs it today, gets injured in a month, and their argument is, well, it's got today's date. It was only meant to apply today. I have a case right now with an argument like that. Person signed it the year prior and their lawyer says this was at a writing club. When the person was injured the following year, the release was ineffective because it was signed the following year. Make it clear when this thing is meant to apply now and at all times in the future. Lay it out. Who does it protect? Put your name in your association, your organization, and broaden it further. Um, and of course, don't forget your state equine liability act language. All states really do differ on how these documents work. And also a quick comment, where do you, what do you do with them? Store them carefully, don't destroy them unless you are positive you don't need them. That's happened in my caseload. We can't find the document and I'm here to try to use a release but it doesn't exist. Hold on to it for as long as you can. Ask your lawyer if you're about to destroy it because you may need that document years into the future. Think safety, above all else, think safety horse with a red ribbon, and you know what that means. You can take the extra effort to think safety, comply with the law, use good documents, and of course, you'll learn about insurance. Well, Ms. Broadway, I don't know how much time I have, so yeah, I'll turn it we're over. Gonna, we're going to take five minutes to get to some questions. Uh, we did have a question specifically in the, the chat that said, could you take just a minute to address Maryland's contributory negligence law and how that fits into this? Any suggestions or a resource you should point them to, Julie? I'm not sure if there's a really good resource out there. It has been a point of controversy in the state of Maryland. By the way, only two states have no equine liability law, and that would be Maryland and California. Many say Maryland is doing just fine without an equine statute. What I'm told, and I haven't researched the law to determine if this is right or not, if you are sued in the state of Maryland, and you can prove that the person who is suing you, the plaintiff, is just 1% liable, I am told by lawyers, that person who sued you takes nothing. This is what I'm told. So they say, hey, we don't need an equine liability law to mess things up. All we have to do is prove that they had just a piece of responsibility and they're done. To the extent that that is the law, that's pretty tempting. Mm. So that may explain why we have no equine liability law. But remember, the information I'm sharing with you is from a lawyer out that way many years ago. So there have been requests 
there's been an interest in creating uh, a push for an equine statute in Virginia. Talk to a lawyer in your state if you're even thinking about that, because it may be that you're doing just fine, just like I was told. Okay, so I'm going to get to one more question, but let me remind you, our objective today is to give you an overview of what's going on in this space and to equip you with resources so you can go and do some additional due diligence on your own. So just be sure to take advantage of that. And again, she's giving you a website you can go to to look up individual uh, equine liability laws in states. So look up your state, make sure you've got that covered. Consider her book, another great resource. And Julie and I, um, frequently speak at the Kentucky Equine Law Conference. And so we know lots of equine attorneys around the country and can point you to someone if you need some help. I did have a person ask in the chat, could you go back one slide, Julie, because you shared something about how long to maintain your documents and they wanted to read that again. So there you go. We are recording the session. So feel free to come to our website um, a little bit later this week and Go back through this material again, and you can quickly pick up on that uh, website that she mentioned, uh, which has got all those uh, equine liability laws uh, from that. Anybody else uh, got a question? And they're asking, could you go back one more slide? Ah, if I can spend just a moment. there. Uh, I've talked about litigation hotbeds, things that are driving people crazy in the legal profession regarding equine liability laws. Here are a couple. One of the biggest issues around the country is whether a parent can legally sign off on the claims of his or her minor child. We're talking parent or legally appointed guardian. Aunt Sue, Uncle Tim, they're not a legal guardian unless a court says so. We're talking about legal guardians and parents. Believe it or not, many state laws or court decisions rather in the states, sometimes laws say parents cannot legally release the claims of their minor children. Interesting, isn't it? especially if you have a lot of children in your activities, but that is the law in many states. So before you jump to conclusions and think I'm home free, the parent has signed, find out if you can where your state squares on it. The other thing I wanted to take away or leave as a takeaway with you is many of you think, well, I'm just gonna have a release, have the signer release me from everything, everything. Can you do that? Unfortunately, many states say there are some things you just can't release away. I gave you the examples, gross negligence, willful and wanton misconduct, intentional wrongdoing. It's fair to say that most states around the country do say you can release away lots of stuff, but not things of that serious degree of wrongdoing. So please be realistic. This release that you're using, if properly worded and signed, could be very powerful, but it may not protect you from everything. One quick thought, lawyers like me, when I represent stables and facilities, I fight to get that release enforced because proving that serious degree of wrongdoing is pretty darn tough. And many a court has said, I understand the injured person says there's gross negligence, willful and wanton misconduct, but it sure doesn't look like it here. Release is enforced, those claims are gone. Please understand that's another complexity. Okay, so I'm going to ask Julie to throw her email address into the chat so you guys know how to contact her if you have a follow-up question. I'm sure she'd be happy to take a few minutes to address what the question you have or to refer you to someone, one of her colleagues who might be specific to your state that could maybe go down even a further level than she might be able to, to, to talk to. So, Julie, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. This was wonderful information, and I think everybody's going to really benefit from it. I'm going to uh, reach out and say, is uh, Stephanie Ortina, out? I see Stephanie, there's Stephanie. So Jarvis Insurance has had a relationship with the American Horse Council for the last several years, and we really value their subject matter experts. Stephanie is one of those. So she's going to spend a few minutes this afternoon talking about the types of insurance coverage they offer, the different questions and the different details you should think of as you perhaps go about um, getting insurance coverage and you know whatever tips or tricks she's got. So Stephanie, take it away. Hi Tina's there. Hi. Tina's in here as well. Oh hi Tina. <laughs> hey, can I can you see me? No, nope, but that's okay. We know you. Can you hear me? I can. Oh good, good. How's everybody doing today? Good. Julie has just given them a really quick overview of what's going on in uh, the country as far as equine liability laws, and I think it's a lot to process and a lot to take in, so we're looking forward to hearing your part of this. Great. 
Great. Well, thank you, Julie. It was great hearing you again. Um, you're always so good to hear and you really explain things so that people can understand. So thank you. But uh, what we wanna talk about is the importance of having insurance. You're operating a business or you have your you know, privately owned horse. It's so important to make sure that you have insurance coverage because your policy is gonna defend you. And that's the thing is you don't wanna to have to pay for an attorney yourself. You wanna have a policy that's gonna defend you because Julie, as you know, lawyers can cost a lot of money per hour. So, um, and, you know, owning a horse, you know, comes with a risk. The horse, horses can be unpredictable. You know, they can hurt somebody. You can't control the situation. So if you have an insurance policy to protect you, it's gonna defend you as well if somebody decides to bring a lawsuit against you. So, so you know, equine, go ahead. So equine liability covers any bodily injury or property damage that may happen as a result of your business. So whether or not it's your horse or something that happens, that's where the liability insurance comes in. And as we know, horses are very unpredictable and anything can happen. So it's very important to have insurance because it's better to have it and not need it than to need it and not have it. And as Tina said, the um, insurance is also going to help pay for your defense costs as well, as well as any other costs that may come associated with claim as well. And there's several different liability policies dependent on what your unique situation is. So if you have, if you own a horse and you are just the simple horse owner and you own a horse just for the, just to enjoy having a horse, there's a private horse owner liability policy. And that's for the individual that has no commercial equine activity whatsoever um, it, or exchange of money. Um, making sure that you're not doing any lessons or training, boarding. Um, insurance companies even go so far as if you own a horse and like you're boarding at a facility and you're letting the facility use the horse in a lesson program for a reduced board, that's an exchange of money and that may be considered a commercial activity. Um, so the private horse owner liability law may, or uh, liability insurance may not be the insurance for you, but that's just for, you know, the individual that has a horse, keeps it at a boarding facility or on your own property or at um, a trainer and the coverage follows the horse wherever it may go. So if your horse were to run out and get loose in the road and cause an accident, your horse owner liability coverage would provide coverage. And um, a lot of times, if you, even if you keep like the horse on your own property, homeowner's insurance doesn't cover horses, doesn't consider them livestock. And that's where this, this liability policy comes into play. Yes. And a, a lot of people don't think that, oh, your homeowners is going to cover that. However, um, homeowners policies can exclude or not cover or will only cover on your premise. So, you know, an annual policy with limits of a million dollars per occurrence, depending on the state for up to three or four horses is $275 annually. You know, that's a minimal cost to have a peace of mind that you have liability insurance for your, for your horse or horses, for your private horses. So um, that's a really good premium to protect you and your assets. And, and it's also, also important to, go ahead, I'm sorry, we're on a time it's delay. It's also important to note that um, the private horse owner liability coverage follows the horse wherever it goes. So if you... Um, go to a horse show or a trail ride or you switch boarding barns, the coverage follows the horse no matter where it's at. Exactly. And we can also um, add the boarding facility as an additional insurance. Many, many um, facilities are now requiring that, which, you know, is understandable. So that that is an option as well, where your homeowners may not um, cover that. 
So that's about it for the private horse owner liability. Now we're moving on to, um, you know, trainers, instructors, people working in, you know, in, in the horse business. Um, it's whether you do lessons, clinics, you operate a, a instruction program. It's so important to have liability coverage for your equine operations. You know, and we could go, you know, and it depends on if you own a farm, we can write farm and liability insurance, we can write package policies, you know, depending on what type of operations you do. You know, if you have, you know, we, we cover instruction, boarding, training, clinics, shows. If you do some specialty items such as birthday pony parties, therapeutic riding, you know, it's all going to depend on your operations as to what type of policy or policies you need. And um, a commercial policy would also be maybe an appropriate policy for you as well. If you're breeding horses to sell, if you're actively buying and selling horses, if you, as we, um, as I had mentioned earlier, like if you're um, letting a boarding barn use your horse for lessons for reduced board, you may need a commercial liability policy. It's all about the insurance company, knowing your operations, charging the appropriate premium for what you do and you're, you know, so you can be protected. Keep in mind that if just because somebody says you're negligent or brings a lawsuit against you, your policy will always investigate and defend, which is hugely important because attorneys can be very expensive. So um, that's that. And, you know, you know, I just want to reiterate something that you, you pointed out. Um, I know that oftentimes when people are trying to think about insurance coverage, they're thinking about how they minimize that premium that they have to pay. Yes. And it's, it's um, not worth, in my personal opinion, it's, it's not worth trying to sort of um, skate over the details of what you might need for coverage to save a few dollars because you are going to need to divulge all the different aspects of your operation in right. order to ensure you've got good coverage. And people um, call our office all the time and ask us questions about uh, you know, where they should go and what they should do. And I say, your homeowner's insurance might not cover you in your state if you have more than X number of horses on your property. So there's lots of little details to really get, to get into and make sure your uh, insurance company understands all the various uses of the horses and the places the horses go and all the various factors that come into play. Absolutely, because more times than not, we're told about something after the insured starts doing it, which is very difficult because if you just talk to us prior to that, we can help make sure that you're covered appropriately. You may need another policy in addition to the current liability policy that you have but a lot of times we don't even know that our clients are doing something because the line of communications aren't open. And we understand that, you know, you want to do what, what you're doing and, and horses, but we also need to know what you're doing so we can protect you, if that makes sense. It does indeed. And I'm just going to holler out a couple of examples that I've had personal phone call. Someone who called and said, I've been invited to use my horse for the upcoming Christmas parade. What should I be concerned about? Oh, wow, yeah. there's a lot of things to think about there. Or sure. someone who says, oh, I've got some extra stalls in the barn at my property, and I'd like to make a little more income, and I'm thinking about uh, offering boarding. Okay, yes. let me give you a list of things to think about. And constantly, we're getting questions like that. So I really encourage everybody on here to think long and hard um, about all those various factors. Absolutely, because you're you're making more exposure, but you may not be covered with your insurance. And that's what we're here for. We're here to answer questions, help you get covered appropriately, figure out what kind of policies you need, what type of coverages you need. So a little earlier, we had a question and I want to make sure we've covered that for this person. They said um, they were interested to know if their horse is being used for lessons in exchange for a discount on board what kind of coverage should they explore, guys? 
It would be a commercial liability policy because now there's an exchange of money. So private horse owner doesn't really apply anymore. Commercial liability policy sh should be the, the policy. And, you know, depending on what you do, minimum premiums start at $600 annually, you know, for, you know, maybe the one horse that's, you know, they're letting somebody use and, and such. Again, that's not a bad price annually in order to be covered if somebody brings a lawsuit against you because defense coverage is huge. An attorney could cost at least half that for one hour. Are there other questions out there that folks have? We're about 10 minutes till the end of our session. So I wanna make sure Everybody has an opportunity to get a question answered. Um, yeah, so somebody has asked out here, can you describe when care, custody, and control insurance is appropriate? Oh, that's a very special issue. Yes, yes. So care, custody, control is specifically for the horse, for the non-owned horse that's part of your operations. It covers the legal liability resulting from injury, sickness, death of a non-owned horse that you're working with. Most policies exclude care custody control. So you have to have this endorsement in order to be appropriately covered. So it's for your boarding horse, your training horse, you know, um, this is the endorsement that's meant to protect you. Um, this is this is also important too because care custody control you know provides coverage for the horse. Um, not only like if your horse a uh, non owned horse were to get hurt, um, if somebody were to come and say you're the reason why my horse got hurt, care custody control would come into play. It's also important to note that if you're working with horses that may have mortality coverage, it may not be the horse owner that comes after you, but may also be the mortality policy that would come that may look to recoup their costs as well. Next question: What type of insurance should an arena venue carry? that is managed by a saddle club. Well, they need, well, in a, uh, yeah, they, they need obviously liability. The, the club needs liability. We also have many club policies and, you know, depending on, you know, it, it goes by the number of shows, mm -hmm. et cetera, et cetera. So absolutely club liability. And depending on the organization, you may want to think about directors and officers, Anybody can call us and we can go into specifics because each club or each individual is different and we can advise accordingly as to what type of insurance that that particular club, organization, or um, business owner needs, what type of insurance they need. Yeah, that, that's great advice. And I appreciate so much that you guys are willing to spend that little one-on-one -on -one time with people who have very specific questions. That's always a great resource that's out there. I know years ago I managed a horse show and it was it was um, under the auspice of a, a local uh, uh, horse breed club uh, and we had uh, coverage, um, but we had to specify exact dates that things occurred yes. and where they occurred and you had to be very detailed because if we decided to have a club meeting on a Saturday just to get together to talk about something and we didn't put that on the list and something happened, it wouldn't be there. Mm. So, right. Yes, we're while everything <laughs> while everything is the same, each individual or each organization is different. So it's always good to fine tune and talk to somebody to see what they actually need. Great. Anybody else questions for our experts today? And I'm happy to share Tina and Stephanie's contact information or if they'll put it in the chat. So they've got your email address that you can reach out to them and, and follow yeah. up with them. If you have some very specific questions, I'm sure they'd be happy to chat with you. Anybody yeah, else? Absolutely. Last, last opportunity for a question before we wrap up today. Great, okay, so one more time. This is being recorded. We'll have it out on our website. Feel free to share it and refer to it um, and uh, reach out to these experts that we've, uh, we've, we've offered today. I'll just remind you that the next uh, webinar that we'll do will be on November the 14th, and we're going to be talking about a shortage of veterinarians in the industry, both small and large, but especially large animal veterinarians. There's a real shortage. We're talking about uh, workforce development and 
what, what are some of the ways that we sort of address some of that? So with that, I have one more question that popped up. Uh, let me see if I can get to it, gals. Hold on. Um, what is the best liability policy for a homeowners association that owns a stable? Hmm. Yeah, that's um. We we do insure those, and it's it it again. It's going to be specific to the homeowners association and what it is that they need. Anybody could reach out to us, and we could talk about the operations and figure out the best policy or policies that that association would need. Right. Depends on their operations and the homeowners and bylaws, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you, everyone. I hope you have a wonderful Monday, a great week, and uh, feel free to reach out to us if you have other topics you'd like to suggest for future webinars. Um, or if you want to um, get in touch with anybody, um, we're happy to share their contact information. So thank you. Have a good afternoon. Thank you.